here. Uh, and before I introduce him, I should introduce us perhaps to you. Uh, uh, my name is Bob Rahimi. I'm a professor at the University of California, San Diego. And these are my students. They're here for uh, two classes. One is for a history class of the 20th century, and another one for a British culture, literature, music class. Right. And uh, we just read which book, guys? Uh, nice. 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 <laughs> and they, with pleasure, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And just to introduce uh, our, our guest speaker today, Mr. Alexander Waugh, of course, is the grandson of Evelyn Waugh, the famous British writer of the two you're familiar with. We have already talked about him in our lectures. Uh, Mr. Waugh is an English businessman, writer, critique, journalist, composer, cartoonist, record producer, and television presenter. It's amazing. Among his other <laughs> accomplishments, he's the general editor of the 42-volume uh, scholarly edition of the complete works of Evelyn uh, Walls for the Oxford University Press. Please, everyone, please welcome our guest here. Thank you. Thank you. And he promised me he's going to sign his book for me afterwards. So, uh, <laughs> You have to send it. Thank you all very much. Um, I see you're mostly women. I don't know if that's to do with the way birth control happens in California. <laughs> anyway, I'm very delighted. I was, I've talked to you all in exactly the same way, whatever sex, size, or shape you are. Um, I'm, I've heard that you've read Vile Bodies. I gather that you've slightly enjoyed it. Um, I could, in effect, talk on almost any uh, aspect of Evelyn Moore. Since he's uh, just said I'm editing his 42 volume. Uh, scholarly edition of all his works and every single thing he wrote which includes not only all the letters and diaries and things that haven't been published also the bits from the manuscripts for instance in Vile Bodies that aren't actually um, in the book that you've seen published um, but since Vile Bodies is what you've read I think probably the best way to deal with this is if I give you some even more background uh, I, have to, I have to disappoint you actually, should I get to this point with over and done with very, very quickly? The disappointment is that I don't actually have any very clear memory today, it's like quite with my grandfather. So in that sense, I'm here on slightly false pretenses. Uh, he died, as you probably know, on Easter Sunday 1966, and I was born in December 1963, so I was about two and a half when he died. Um, I have a f number of photographs of him uh, dandling me upon his knee. He dedicated his last book a little learning, which was his autobiography to me and to my sister and two other grandchildren. He gave me a very nice silver cup. He was very proud of it because he discovered, even more you may have heard, was slightly snobbish. Um, and he discovered something really interesting, which is called a armorial achievement. Now, what that means is you all have your family surname, and some of your families are armigerous. That's to say that your, your name bears a coat of arms. Uh, there's a lot of muddle about this in America, in fact, whether it's legal or not, but uh, you do have a coat of arms. And if, if your, both your parents, your, i.e. your mother and her maiden name, your father have a coat of arms, then you can effectively split your, your shield, as it were, in two, and then you've got a mother and a father on each side. If your grandparents all had coat of arms, you can split it into four, and so on and so forth. And you can't really boast an armorial achievement until you're, you've got 16 quarterings, that's your great-great-grandparents. Evelyn Moore, as it is known, was a little bit of a snob, and my father, who was his oldest son, married the daughter of an earl, which excited him no small amount. And then he realised the moment I was born that he could get a shield and, and cut it into 16 uh, quarterings, because all of my 16 great-great-grandparents had coats of arms. This is very exciting if, you, if you're interested in the real intricacies of snobbery. Because um, <laughs> it makes it makes me in this one particular way slightly grander than someone who's obviously far grander than I am, like the Duke of Devonshire. The Duke of Devonshire's uh, mother was a sort of American like you and didn't wasn't interested in coats of arms and wouldn't be able to grow sixteen quarterings. Anyway, so I cut all this rubbish short. Uh, even more was so excited when he discovered my sixteen quarterings that he gave me as a Christmas present a huge silver plate uh, with the a christening present with the uh, sixteen quarterings emblazoned upon it. That actually got stolen, and I haven't seen it for many years. It's probably melted down and gone since the end of it. So, in short, my actual physical connection to Evelyn Moore is not so great. I remember very clearly his house uh, after he died. His library was gutted and sold to the University of Texas in 1968. Uh, and I remember the room very clearly gutted. I remember the, the side of it gutted. He was very eccentric in his love of decoration, and all the woodwork in the house was painted black, which seemed rather strange, and he had flock wallpaper in the hall, making it look like a rather low-grade Indian restaurant, <laughs> um, but he felt it was very grand. 
he was a very funny man, and I think that probably comes out in, in the book Vile Bodies you've read. Some of you may have found a, a disconnection with it, in the sense that who are these people, and, uh, and, and how different are they from you Californian students? Uh, what I can tell you is they're very real people. Uh, most of the people in Vile Bodies were based precisely on people that even more new. In fact, all the books he wrote, that one probably has the most direct connection to real people. Even the Prime Minister is real, Mr. Um, uh, Outrage, I think he's called in that, who was, of course, uh, Ramsay MacDonald, um, and various different people in it. I won't go through the list of who those people are, because again, they won't really mean anything to you. But what was happening to Evelyn Moore at that time was he got swept up in a movement which has now since become quite famous called Bright Young Things. The Bright Young Things were um, obsessive party goers. Uh, they were led really by someone called Babe Magusty. Uh, Babe, uh, it's a very silly name, I'm afraid to say, but uh, she was immensely rich because her stepfather owned a, owned a betting shop. And so she came along in a, in a Rolls Royce. Oh, I'm talking about young people in their 20s and, and 20s. And she came along in a Rolls Royce and paid for a great number of these parties. And the parties always had themes. Um, and so you've got parties and obvious themes, like parties and masks and parties. In fact, you might remember in, in Vile Bodies, there's a description of parties. By the end of it, he gets very fatigued. And I think he says, all these vile bodies. Um, Every single one of those parties can be traced to real parties that actually happened in London. Uh, on m many of them, we know the exact dates of them. We know who the people were who held them. Um, and they were ridiculous parties. These young, showing off people were making a great nuisance of themselves. These were the, uh, the generation that hadn't fought in the First World War and the generation who were quite pissed off, if I'm allowed to use that expression, with their parents and with the uh, older generation, and were sort of, if you like, letting their hair down. Um, and even in war, you shouldn't really think, it's often reported, if you've read about him, that he was, in a sense, at the center of the Bright Young Things movement. Uh, he wasn't. He, he really was standing with people like Noel Coward and the novelist Beverly Nichols, uh, who were observing and criticizing it. He was certainly there. He was certainly on the fringes. Uh, but all descriptions of him at these parties, he was um, really looking with his great Google eyes very critically at the whole thing. And of course, in the end, like Noel Coward, like Beverly Nichols, was actually working and putting it into satire and bar bodies. So I think to get an understanding of Evelyn War, and therefore a greater understanding of vile bodies. What I'd like to do is give you a small overview of his life prior to writing um, uh, uh, that book, uh, to understand who he was. Uh, England is, always has been, obsessed with class. You've probably got that from my opening remarks when I talked to you about the shield with the uh, emblazons on it. Uh, and it's a great shame, and I think England is poisoned by, by class problems, but never mind, I could do a separate a dissertation on that matter. But uh, to understand Evelyn War, you do need to understand class, English class, to some extent. He was born into what I think would be called the, well, family would be called the middle class. Um, that's to say, uh, he wasn't aristocratic, he wasn't privileged. His father uh, was very, had a very modest income and worked in the publishing trade. His father was a, a man of letters. He wrote books, he wrote an autobiography. Um, and he ended up being uh, managing director and later chairman of the publishing company Chapman and Hall. And Chapman and Hall, as some of you may know, published Evelyn Moore's books. So before you jump to the conclusion uh, that that was just a neat piece of nepotism, I'll have to put you right on that because the story is far more interesting than a neat piece of nepotism about how he ended up being published by his father's company. But before we get there, so Evelyn Moore was the second son. There were only two children in this family. He was the second son. His older brother, Alec, was five years older. Um, his father uh, was known, is known in our family as the Brute. And the reason he's known as a Brute, he was a Brute, he was a very nasty piece of work, and a sort of uh, malicious and sadistic. And he squashed wasps on his wife's face, and he woke up all his children, that's the my great-grandfather who we're talking about, Arthur War and shoved them in a cupboard in, in the middle of the night in their pyjamas, and then shouted through the door, kiss my gun case. I don't suppose, I'm sure all of you have had some sort of tra traumatic experiences in your lives. 
Uh, but the idea of being uh, woken up in the middle of the night, shoved into a dark tub and asked to kiss a gun case is the most peculiar, perhaps not the most tra traumatic, one of the most peculiar punishments I've ever heard. Anyway, uh, he was brought up and hated his father, the brute. This is Arthur, okay? We're talking about Evelyn Waugh's father, Arthur Waugh. Hated his own father and had a miserable childhood. So he decided when he had children that he was going to indulge his son. He was very, very keen on his firstborn son, who was called Alec. And his ambition for Alec, from the moment that Alec was born, was that Alec should become a great novelist. Uh, Arthur Waugh wanted to be a writer. Uh, but he didn't really make it. He did write a few biographies. He said he wasn't a great writer. He did a lot of literary criticism. He was for 30 years the chief book critic of the Daily Telegraph. But he was very, he dreamt as a young person of being a great poet. He wrote the first biography of Tennyson, which came out about six days after Tennyson died. Um, but he never made as a great writer, so he put all his hopes and all his aspirations into his firstborn son, who was called Alec. Evelyn was not born until five years later, so he was younger, and he was given, as you've probably already realized, a rather girlish name. Uh, Arthur Waugh was very determined that he was going to put all his love and all his efforts into his oldest son, and was disappointed when he had another son. What he wanted was a girl, and then he would have a girl and a boy, and that would all be very neat, and he could uh, bring up the boy to be a great writer, and the girl, well, you know, in those days, who cares, with nice little pretty dresses didn't work out that way, so they called him Evelyn, which is a girl's name, and they put him in pretty dresses anyway, and <laughs> Alec was encouraged to call the, the, his younger brother It. I think that derives from the fury and frustration of not having had a girl. So Evelyn was known as It for the first five or six years of his life, and put in dresses and given a girl's name. Well, the brother was trained and trained to be a great writer, and amongst the great training, at the age of six, he was given the part of Hamlet to act, the whole of Shakespeare's Hamlet. I think he can't have been the whole of the age of six, but he certainly did large chunks of it. Um, his father read him all the great poetry of the um, Elizabethan era and the Jacobethan era and all that. And, and he learned poetry by heart and was learned to read and was encouraged to write books, start writing books. So I think you can probably already see within this family that the bit of tension is, is, is almost bound to brew up. It has been said, I don't know if any of you here have read any Evelyn Waugh biographies, but it has been said that it's all fine because although Arthur Waugh loved his eldest son first, his wife, Catherine Waugh, my great-grandmother, loved her younger son, Evelyn Best, so it was all nicely balanced. It wasn't actually the case. In fact, there's a rather uh, alarming little story of Evelyn, aged about eight or nine, going to his mother and saying, you know that Daddy loves Alec Best. Uh, um, does that mean that uh, you love me best? And she said... No, it doesn't. No, I, I, like, I, I love you both the same. And he said, therefore, I'm lacking in love. He'd obviously done the mathematics and uh, realized it didn't work. So you're beginning to get a picture, I hope, of a boy who right from the start, it feels as though he's an outsider from the very family that he's born to. Um, Alec then goes off to a posh public school uh, near, uh, in uh, Dorset called Sherburn. And the father is so obsessed with Alec at this stage that it's almost like a teenage love affair between the father and son. Every weekend, the father gets on the train from London where he's working at the Chapman Hall Publishing Office, and he goes straight down to where his uh, elder son is at boarding school. He stays the weekend in a hotel with his son at the boarding school. He entertains all his son's friends. In his pocket, wherever he goes, he carries a book with all the names of his son's uh, the names of the people at his son's school, Alex's school, ticking them, the ones he likes, crossing. I've still got that book, the ones that aren't so nice. He befriends all the masters, and he becomes completely and utterly engaged and entangled in the life of his older son. So you're going to imagine that Evelyn is way out of all of this. Um, and then uh, the, for, for the father's birthday, they start writing things, and it becomes quite obvious, I think, that and uh, uh, Evelyn does have some serious talent. He goes to a, uh, a different school called Lansing, which he feels is very inferior, and writes, if any of you get the time uh, to read it, a very short story called Winner Takes All. That little story is about two boys, one of them who is utterly indulged and utterly loved by his mother, and the younger one who isn't. And the uh, winner takes all, the older brother gets absolutely everything, including the final twist at the end, he, he steals the younger brother's wife. This is uh, an example of how Evelyn Waugh's uh, work is very autobiographical. He's writing about his own experiences very often, as indeed he is in, um, in, in vile bodies. 
So anyway, he goes to the public school, which isn't such a good public school as his brother's given, so again, another great chip on his shoulder. But interestingly enough, there are people at the public school, sorry, I must explain to you Americans, public school is probably what you think means private school in America. Um, we call it a public school, it's a fee-paying school, it means that anyone can go to it, and therefore it's called a public school. Of course, anyone who can pay for it can go, but it's open to anyone who can pay, so it's called public. Uh, 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 the other type of school in England is called a state school. I think probably in America you call it a private school. Yeah. Evelyn went to an inferior public school to his brother, and interestingly enough, there were fellow pupils of him there who thought he was a great genius. He hadn't done anything, but we have a testimony of, of boys at the time who say, this guy has got the most extraordinary genius. And one of them, who's called Dudley Carew, went around boasting, saying, my friend at school is called Evelyn Warren. He's a genius. They wanted rubbish. Well, you're a bore. And he said, I bet he'll turn out to be a great genius. And they said, go away, stop being boring. <laughs> and he collected up every little letter and every little thing that Evelyn Moore scribbled to him at school and sold this in 1969 a huge fortune against the University of Texas. And uh, was actually proved right. So I don't know what he'd exactly seen in him, but clearly he was very different from other boys. What you'll see in Evelyn Moore time and time and time again is a, is a desire to fit in, and it never, never works. The whole biography of Evelyn Moore, as I've just explained to you, with his family, it starts with his family, he wants to fit in, he isn't. He's the odd one outside of his family. He then tries very hard at school to be part of all the teams and to try and be a prefect and try and do this, and it, it just doesn't work. He's got his effort into it, and he feels rejected in the end. You get that theme again with the Catholic Church, he, as you, I'm sure many of you know here. He converted to Catholicism in 1930, just after writing, um, uh, uh, or actually in the middle of writing Bar Bodies. And, and then he had a pretty broken heart about that too in, in later life when um, all the maths and the liturgy was changed. He was very desperate to join the army in the Second World War and he wanted a fighting post. He was technically a bit too old for it and he really bossed and pushed and angled to get himself a fighting position. Um, he was very brave in the war. I don't know whether the real reasons why he wanted, I think there were two reasons why he really wanted it. He had the memories of his brother who had fought in the First World War, and of course was the great hero, and Daddy saying, when is, when is darling Alec coming home? And then he turned up in his uniform and everyone gave him a party, and then off he went to the trenches. And, you know, having an older brother like that, who anyway already is the hero of the family, then actually being the so-called hero and going off and fighting in the First World War, and even again feeling left out of all that, I think that might have been another reason why he wanted to fight in the Second World War. Uh, I think also that he was fully aware that as a novelist by that stage, he needed experience. You can't be a novelist with no experience. If you see the letters he wrote to my father who wanted to become a novelist, you can't, you can't do it unless you have experience. You can't just sit down and say, my job's going to be a novelist and I'm going to make some money. You really have to go out and uh, be in the army or work in a hospital or do something that gives you experience to do it. Um, so I think that was another reason he wanted to fight. Anyway, um, uh, there was a slight tangential point there, because what I want to say is about the army as well. Uh, he fell out of love with it. And his, what many people think is his masterpiece, um, the trilogy, the last three books he wrote about the war, the last three novels, they map the uh, sense of excitement and joy and belonging of the army in the First World War and take it right through to crashing disillusionment and really depression about the whole thing. So right throughout his life, you'll get this theme of belonging and not belonging. In fact, I think in, in Vile Bodies, you, you, you also get that sense there, too, that he's, that very speech we talked about, the parties, you know, why is he going to the parties? He wants to belong in a strange way, but he doesn't. He's too cynical, and he sits on the edges and, and looks at it, and is always really the outsider. Um, so the interesting thing, then, about I know this thing about Chapman and Hall and, and how he got published there, because I think it is extremely interesting. Arthur Waugh, um, as I told you, was managing director from 1902, I think it was, of Chapman Hall, even more born in 1903, so even more brought up with this man running this, his father running this publishing company, and he stayed with Chapman Hall all the way through till he retired as chairman in about 1931 or 32. Um, Arthur Waugh loved literature more than anything in the world, and I told him he wanted to be a writer, Chapman Hall had a big sort of science books division, but he wasn't really very interested in that. And what Arthur Waugh wanted to do in all those years when he was managing Chapman Hall was to make the literature division of that publishing company very strong. 
And he was terrified right from the moment he took on the job in 1902 because the main source of income for the fiction department was Dickens. <laughs> and in those days, um, copyright, now, nowadays the, the copyright is worked out from the moment you die. So for instance, even the war he died in 1966, our family will get no more income from his books after 70 years after his death. So it takes us back to 1936. That's the, I think internationally the rule now. Though. But in those days, um, certainly in England, the copyright was on a, a certain period after the date of publication of a book. Now what Chapman and Hall had was the rights to the complete set of Dickens. And these were very valuable. Because although as each of the Dickens books started falling out of copyright, no other publisher could do a complete set. And it was the complete sets that mattered. And what Arthur War was panicking about is what will we do when the last Dickens book, which um, I think is called Edwin and Drood, when the last Dickens book falls out of, out of copyright and then every other publisher can do complete Dickens sets. Now, interestingly enough, the last Dickens book to go out of copyright was about to fall out in 1928. Um, 1928, some of you may know, was in fact the same year that Evelyn War published his first novel called Decline and Fall. Um, Arthur War died in 1943, by which time Evelyn War was world famous, well, English speaking world famous novelist. But Arthur War never, to his dying day, would accept the fact that Evelyn was a better novelist than his older son, Alec, who wrote an awful lot of trashy novels that are no longer in print and not very interesting. Um, <laughs> and um, so this went on, and he didn't like. Arthur Waugh did not like Evelyn Waugh's books. Evelyn Waugh, uh, having left Oxford University, where he messed about and got extremely drunk and had a few orgies and got a hell of a lot of hangovers, I imagine, um, came away without a degree and then didn't have a job and then he was at his wit's end. A lot of this is described in his brilliant uh, first volume of his autobiography called A Little Learning. Um, and he had no home, so he had to live with his parents, which he didn't like having to do. Um, and he was at a loss. And then he fell in love, as people do, and wanted to get married. The woman he wanted to marry was rather posh, and her father was dead, but her mother said, absolutely no possibility are, are you going to marry my daughter, because I hear the most disgusting things about you. The most disgusting things that this potential mother-in-law had heard about Evelyn Waugh came straight from the mouth of Evelyn Waugh's tutor at Oxford University, who was called C.R.M.S. Cutwell. Now, some of you who were really observant when you were reading Bio Bodies would have noticed the name Cutwell crops up. Actually, I don't remember precisely how. He's a very passing part. I think he's an MP or something. Um, actually, the name Cutwell is put into all of Evelyn Waugh's books to denote a stupid, boring, tiresome, <laughs> unpleasant person, <laughs> one after another and another. And Crutchwell himself, who was even more stupid, grew madder and madder and, and frothed at the mouth for attention every time a new Evelyn Moore book was coming out because it was going to have an assault on Crutchwell in it. He wrote um, a very amusing story called um, Mr. Lovejoy's Little Outing. I don't know if any of you have read that. This is a story uh, about a young girl who goes with her mother to meet their father at a lunatic asylum. And they're talking in the car, and they arrive at the lunatic asylum, and the young girl sees her father, not very interested in her father, who really is quite unique, he tried to hang himself in the orangery in front of the Chester Martins or something. She sees her father, but then she's taken by another man in the lunatic asylum who's called Mr. Loveday, was called Mr. Crutwell. Um, and Mr. Loveday seems incredibly nice, and incredibly sane, and very pleasant. And so this daughter starts campaigning for Mr. Loveday to be let out of the lunatic. Why is he here? Why is he in this mental asylum when he's such a pleasant fellow and he seems so nice and rational? And they say, many, many years ago, he strangled a woman on a bicycle. And she says, you never mind that. It's not a long time ago. And look how pleasant he is now and how sane and, and nice. And so she campaigns and campaigns. And eventually they say, all right, then we'll let him out. And so the day comes, and, and Mr. Loveday is let out of the lunatic asylum, and all the lunatics and doctors and everyone assemble and give him a good cheer and a wave off the trumpets. And about half an hour later, he's seen coming back up the drive. And they say, why are you coming back? He said, it's all I wanted, just, just a nice little outing. 
and half a mile down the road they find, of course, a lady strangled on her bicycle. Uh, he's done the same thing. Why I bothered to elaborate on the whole story of, of, of Mr. Loveday is not just because Mr. Loveday was originally called Mr. Crutwell, because Evelyn Moore hated Crutwell too much, but Mr. Loveday was actually based on Evelyn Moore's father, mm. Arthur Waugh. Arthur Waugh had an obsession about women on bicycles. He wrote a little book called The Wheel, a little book of poetry, which is all about women on bicycles. He gave young women bicycle lessons. He courted my great-grandmother, his wife, on a bicycle. Those of you who have read Brideshead Revisited will remember a amusing episode when the father of Charles Ryder says, you must go to France on a holiday. Lovely, lovely women on bicycles there. It's all a tease against his father. But not only was Evelyn Moore teasing Crutwell, he was also teasing his father in all of these books. Um, I'm going to get to the irony of that and how amusing it is in a minute. I've already told you about a story published by Evelyn Moore's father called Winner Takes All, which takes the piss out of his father for favouritising his brother. Um, and I've mentioned to you about Mr. Loveday's little outing, which takes the piss out of his father for having a, a rather sinister sexual predilection for women on bicycles. Um, but it goes on. First of all, let me get to this point, I keep trying to get to, I can wander off in different directions, about why Evelyn Moore was published by Chapman Hall as part of the company. So, he wanted to get married, he didn't have any m money, and this woman had heard a lot of filth from Crutchwell and says, you're not marrying my daughter. Um, Arthur Waugh had looked at Decline and Fall, his first novel, and said, it's too disgusting, I'm not going to publish it. He had taken it down the road in Henrietta Street, where Chapman Hall was, to another publisher called Duckworth, and Duckworth said, we're not going to publish it either unless you change all this, this dirty bits of it. In those days, it was very strict. You couldn't start saying that people had intercourse with sheep, for instance, uh, which you can now, and he did in, in those of the age. So then his father, in June, uh, went off uh, on holiday with his wife to France. And while he was out, Evelyn Moore went into the offices of Chapman Hall, where his absent father was technically the boss, and said, I don't really, I need to get married actually immediately and I need some money. And um, will you very kindly look at this book very quickly and make a decision without my father? I don't think my father should make it because I'm his son and it'll be a bit biased. And of course, so you make the decision without him. And a board of about six people sat around the table and voted to publish it by one vote. Gave him a cheque that very minute. He took the cheque and ran straight to the church and married this uh, woman for Evelyn Gardner without telling his parents and without telling um, uh, Evelyn Gardner's mother, the one who so strongly didn't want him to get married. So that's what he did. That marriage um, turned out to be uh, a great failure, um, and we'll come to that this time, because of course it's very much to do with uh, the book we've read, with, Black, uh, um, with Our Bodies. But before we come to that, um, the kind of all this first novel was published, it had a very good reception. Um, Arnold Bennett, who was the top uh, critic at the time, gave it a very good review. And it sold okay, sold reasonably well. Um, and this was in 1928. By 1930, then we get Vile Bodies, and Vile Bodies sold like hotcakes. And again, Arthur Ward didn't like it. And here you're beginning to see this marvellous little bit of irony that's developing here is Chapman and Hall's fiction list that Arthur Warren had been spending 20, 30 years trying to save after the Dickens copyright collapsed, were in fact saved by the novels of his younger son, who he didn't like, and who he never believed was as good a novelist as his older son. And not only was that extraordinary irony that he had to face up to the fact uh, that this was happening, but he also had to bear the mockery that went on against him in all the books that Evelyn wrote before the, um, well, and in Brideshead too, so up to Brideshead Revisited. So where is the mockery then of Arthur War in Vile Bodies? Um, actually, he, he's mocked in the character of a person called Blunt, um, who has a house called Doughton Hall, if you remember this bit. He's the sort of potential father-in-law who signs the check with Charlie Chaplin. Um, <laughs> Arthur War loved more than anything um, uh, theatricality, plays. Uh, he wanted to be an actor. 
he ran a very, very silly thing in Hampstead where they live, which is an amateur dramatic society, and put on extremely embarrassing plays, mainly okay. with women, young girls, and bicycles. And, women. <laughs> and um, so he's in that. And, and in 1926, a, a gang of students from Oxford University, Evelyn and his friends, decided to make a film it's called The Scarlet Woman. It still exists. It's a black and white film. And obviously black and white in 1926, but it's a silent movie is what I meant. And it has in it a woman who then became rather famous called Elsa Lanchester. And in fact, in her very first part, you'll see her in a very small part um, in Mary Poppins, that film, which she was also a very famous film called The Feast of Frankenstein, I think. Mm. Famous black and white film. Anyway, she was in that. She became quite a star, but her very, very first role was in this student-made um, uh, uh, silent movie with Evelyn Moore. Evelyn Moore wrote the script, and they filmed it in the garden at uh, North End Road in the house of Arthur War, Evelyn Moore's house. And Evelyn Moore, uh, sorry, Arthur War was hobbling around saying, oh, be careful, don't break that decanter, that's my best decanter. Oh, can I have a part? Can I have a, can I be a super in this? Can I, can I just hold a spade in the background? They kept saying, no, no, you can't. I don't know how well you remember this book, but exactly that. A uh, little scene seems to go on uh, with the with the man who owns the house wanting to get a little part in the film, and so that is a, a very deliberate mockery of his father. And the mocking uh, went on and on and on. Um, if any of you get to the stage where you read a book called *Handful of Dust*, which many say is Evelyn Moore's greatest masterpiece, uh, it's about broken marriage. Um, the wife is unfaithful. Jack will have Evelyn Moore and runs off with a lover. And to get away from the depression and horror of it, uh, the husband it takes himself off on a sort of exploration holiday to South America. And he goes up the Amazon, he gets in the jungle, and there he finds uh, a strange man in the jungle, oddly enough, surrounded by a tribe of people, many of whom are his children by many of the women. And the man happens to love Dickens, and he has a worm-eaten set of Dickens. <laughs> and he says to the Englishman who's arrived on the boat up the Amazon, he says, will you read me some Dickens? And he starts reading them. And then he says, will you read me another one? And the man says, yes, I'm very happy to keep reading Dickens, but when is the boat arriving? I need to get out of here. I need to get back. I have, I have a house in, uh, in England to deal with. Yes, yes, they'll come, he says, they'll come. In fact, a rescue party does come, and this swine puts the uh, poor Englishman to sleep and he's never found, so he, he spends the rest of his days in this fortress way reading Dickens uh, to a man in the jungle. This has very obvious mirrors and psychological um, uh, connections to what was really going on. Um, Arthur War, as I said to you, was obsessed by the Dickens copyright. He was the main publisher of Dickens. He was chairman of the Dickens Society. He had done the most elaborate edition of Dickens. Um, and he used to go around the country reading Dickens rather ostentatiously, and he used to try and read Dickens at home to his sons, and even more found it appalling and embarrassing and painful uh, listening to reading Dickens. So there you get, in this tragic end of the book, Handful of Dust, this whole situation reversed, and I think one of Evelyn Moore's great themes, again, it will come out in, in, in Vile Bodies, is what is barbarism, what is civilization? Is it actually obvious? You know, the, the old fashioned Victorian idea from which I suppose you grew out is barbarism means being in the jungle and civilization means being in London. Uh, but as you can all see from, from Vile Bodies, he obviously realizes that London is pretty barbarous. Uh, and so there he is, trapped, having to read uh, Dickens in the jungle, uh, just as. He was when he was at home, as I said to you, he still doesn't have a house and he's living with his parents. He's trapped with his father, who's the one who reads Dickens to him at home in the evenings. So you see that a lot of the things you'll find in Evelyn Moore's books are autobiographical. He, it would be wrong to say he doesn't have an imagination, but his imagination works in very strange ways. He would take aspects, if he knew you lot well, he would take an aspect from you and an aspect from you and possibly one from you. So you get two, two women and a man sometimes. You do that. You put them into one character. The cleverness of his imagination is the way he, he sees the world as a, as a crazy place full of uh, coincidences, full of extraordinary happenings. 
uh, and you read them and your very first reaction is well, that that can't happen that's just a joke for a novel and then the more you go through life the more you realize it is exactly how that is you do bump into the same strange person do you remember the the man he wins a gambling debt from in in the book um and then he can't collect on it and we're sort of led to believe well the man's not trying to dodge him so he doesn't have to pay but not really the case, because every time that man crops up and saying, oh, by the way, yes, I owe you this money, I to get it sorted, and then he gets interrupted, he goes off somewhere else. It, it, that, it's very, very like real life, as I find it, anyway, and I suspect I'm older than you lot, but um, <laughs> I think you will find <laughs> that real life is like that. People come up who you've met a long time ago, and they're suddenly rather different, and they're suddenly in different jobs, and it's all a bit nutty, and you're trying to make sense of it. I think that one of the most wonderful things about reading Evening War is the sense the sense of the present the sense of no real apprehension about the future, no real regret about the past you're, you're experiencing life, it is, it's a very life affirming thing and although you can say he's a satirist I don't believe there's any character in any Evening War book, even the silly little couple characters, who I wouldn't personally like to meet. I want to see these people. So when we call it satire, it's not it's not just about crushing people and saying, oh they're silly because. In fact even more tried to explain later in life that he wasn't really a satirist. Uh, what I think he is 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 an extraordinarily observant um, writer about life and about society and about people and and in it, you feel that great sense of enthusiasm and fascination that he would sit with his eyes, he had the great staring eyes, uh, just fascinated by every person. I know uh, a woman, tell me if I'm going on too long, you can have some questions as well. Uh, there's a, a lovely old woman who, at age about 16, became nanny to Evelyn Moore's children, and I still meet her from time to time, and she tells a story. She came down from the north of England and her father was a coal miner in the north of England. They were very, very poor. She was one of about eight or nine children, and they had no money at all. And she came down to be a nanny for Evelyn Moore's children. And she said, one day, Evelyn Moore said, I, your, your father's a coal miner. He said, I've never, I've never met a coal miner. I'd be fascinated to see a coal miner. So the poor fellow, we were all just sort of space, we walked down from the north of England. We stayed a whole weekend uh, with uh, Evelyn Moore. And Graham Green, the writer, turned up. And the coal miner and Graham Green and Evelyn Moore and the little nanny all went off to the cinema and they went and saw The Third Man, which had just come out, must have been 1948. And Evelyn Moore took the coal miner on a, on a boat trip and he had goggling eyes and just asked him everything he possibly could about coal mining. I don't think, I, mean, I don't know, I don't think it did ever appear in any novel or anything, but that's the way he, he treated life, was a, a fascinating experience. And, he was interested in everybody, and how can I put that into the book? Now, of course, some people got extremely cross. Um, people got very cross in, in bio bodies. Uh, they felt they were being lampooned. Um, there's a man in bio bodies called Miles Maltakis. In fact, in the, um, in the first edition, uh, he was called Martin uh, Gaethorn Brody. And it was a, a very, very clearly taking the piss out of a man called um, Martin Wilson and his boyfriend, who was called Eddie Gaythorn Hardy. And uh, obviously they got quite angry, so they changed the name. Uh, similarly, uh, Lord Beaverbrook, who was the great owner of newspapers, um, uh, I think, in, in, if I remember correctly, in Vile Bodies, is called Lord Monomark. Um, actually, in the manuscript, he's called Lord Otterco. So obviously, Otter Co, Beaver Brook, it's all getting a bit similar, and I think he realised just before it came out he better quickly change that. Um, I think there's a, there was someone called Lady Mary Oppenheimer, and I think he originally called her something like o Oppenheimer or something, but she, you know, what she called in the book? She was a, uh, something like Mrs. Uh, what are you doing? Um, but anyway, so that's what he was doing, and, and he was putting all these people in, and it was a very strange time in his life, because the first marriage, which I've just told you about, it actually only uh, lasted about 14 months, and then she ran off uh, with what Ibrahim described as a ramshackle oaf from the BBC, who was called 
Hager, John Hager. Um, and uh, this happened right in the middle of writing um, uh, Vile Bodies. And even more, very much later in life, <laughs> when he brought out an edition of Vile Bodies in 1965, said uh, that he had this trauma in the middle of writing Vile Bodies. It opens up a great area of excitement for literary critics to say, well, can we really spot uh, where the scene takes place? D does, does, the, does the book get blacker as it goes on? Or does it you carry on in a rather cheery way? Um, some of the editors have looked at the manuscript and say, well, you started getting very sloppy with um, punctuation, which I showed you not really contemplating even the date because his marriage had fallen into it. Um, I, I feel with Fire Bodies, it's, it's, it's very difficult with Evil Moore. Whenever you, whichever book you read, the last one you've read, you say is the best. Uh, but I happen to love Vile Bodies. I think it's a very, very clever book. I think the way he starts with that whole bunch of people on a boat, it's very difficult and dangerous to, to start a book with lots and lots of people. It's, you know, it's kind of a turn off. Who are all these people? Where am I? I'm on a boat. Who are they? But he, he times it, especially if you read it the second time. Maybe the first time you think, oh, help, what's going on? But read it through again. Just see how, how just each character gets just a perfect couple of sentences. Just... It's, it's really masterful, and you have to remember that this was written in 1929, published in 1930, even more born in um, 1903, so he was effectively 26 years old when he wrote it, um, not, not much older than some of you, perhaps younger than some of you, um, and, and he does seem to have this complete mastery. He was absorbed in literature from a very, very early age, of course, by his parents, and was very critical. And if you read his diaries, his school diaries, you can know exactly which books he's reading and how he criticizes them and how he and and he had a brilliant <coughs> ear. I think also looking at our bodies, that telephone conversation between Nina and um, Adam. And it, I think uh, I should have read it this morning, shouldn't I again? Because I'm 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 slightly relying on on slightly old memories. But is that a chapter on its own, or is it just a no? It's just a, it's a section on its own, isn't it? And yeah. it's just done entirely in dialogue. And again. Um, there are lots of writers, great writers, important writers, who, who look on that and praise it for its extraordinary mastery and its thing, something that I think many writers would love to be able to repeat and copy. Um, but there's something that even more had, which is inimitable. I and mean, actually, when you when you think of who were the writers, given even more stature of a writer, as a writer, who were the writers who followed him? Did he, did he start a new trend in writing? Oddly enough, I don't think he did, and yet he is one of the most admired writers. I met um, Zadie Smith, I don't know if you come across her, she's a young uh, novelist, English novelist, very successful now, and she told me she's one of her greatest influences, and even more, I can't believe it, over the years. But whether they can do it, they can't, they can admire it, <laughs> and then they all go off and do different things. Would anyone like to ask any questions, or should we develop this into a conversation? Um, or have I tired you with the <laughs> bombast of my voice? Can I ask a quick question? Is that okay? Uh, Please. Yeah. Uh, before this, uh, you went to the video about the Galloway. Yeah. And you were contrasting this love as well, and this style of writing with the video world. But before we get to the uh, style of writing, um, do you all have any interaction or any opinions about the junior work on the whole scheme of consciousness movement? It's very extraordinary, given how important the junior work was, um, that they didn't seem to come across each other at all. That the only times he ever writes about her, uh, he spells her name roughly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he would have liked her writing. Mm -hmm. He did like some intense psychological women's writing. He was a fan of Catherine Mansfield, for instance. Um, uh, his writing is very, very different. I mean, how funny that you can Mrs. Dalloway and then, yeah. and then that. You couldn't be more different. I mean, Evelyn Moore, for starters, says openly, I am not interested in psychology. So what do you actually mean by that? When you, when you read Evelyn Moore's books, is that book that, you know, that you just, you've just read, what he's really doing is he's repeating a cinema experience. Even Moore went to the cinema pretty well every single day in her school holidays. And in those days, it was black and white cinema. And you would get um, things with written dialogue underneath it, and you'd see the images. And Evelyn Moore's technique for writing a novel is to say, 
what do I see? You will never say, uh, so and so felt depressed and anxious. You'll say, so and so moved in a way or, or, or described a face. So it will give you a sense of what the person's thinking. Uh, but he's very cinematic, and his genius really is the way he juxtaposes scenes. He hated boredom as well. He could not bear boredom. That's why he, I think he found Dickens too much for him. Long, long novels. But he, he, he always wants to be entertaining to himself, not to anything else. So that's why you get those very short scenes juxtaposed to other ones. And Virginia Woolf uh, is so much the opposite. I mean, there's a woman who, as we all know, takes suicide in the end, and. Um, and was very, very mixed up about her sexuality, about her position in, um, in letters, and very, very introvert. And I, I'm an admirer of Virginia Woolf, but I, I don't like her novels terribly much. I do like her essays. I think she, she writes good English when she's doing it well. But really, they were, they were talking shoes. Mm. Mm. Any other questions? Yes. Um, in the novel Vile Bodies, he writes a lot about the divine, and he kind of talks about it in the sense of people like believing that divine things don't happen, but then there's other characters who really, um, like Mrs. Ace and the angels, who kind of have like a, an interesting relationship with the divine, and, and it seemed to me to be commentary on like a decline of religiosity. And would you say, because you were saying that he more talks about fascination of based on observations as opposed to social commentary. So, like, what would you say about his relationship to religion in terms of this novel? Um, so, so, as we know, he, he converted to Catholicism shortly after it was written. Mm -hmm. A lot of the mistakes have been made about this. There's a character, for instance, called um, Father Rothschild in the book. Mm -hmm. um, Evelyn Waugh says of him, uh, the slippery Jesuit is, is, is a figure from 200 years of English literature. It has nothing to do with any Jesuit priests I know. Father Darcy was the man who converted him. He hadn't actually met Father Darcy until after that novel was introduced. Uh, Mrs. Melrose Ape uh, is based on an American woman whose name at the moment is escaping me. It's a very precise thing with all those angels' wings and violin cases and things. I don't know if she um, was threatened to sue. Um, and again, uh, I think really it's, it, it, it's laughter there. I don't think, um, interesting. I think somewhere, and I, I'm afraid I can't give you the exact source, somewhere Evelyn Wall wrote that when he wrote uh, Vile Bodies, he was at his most atheist. So it's interesting that, that going from your most, most atheist to, to converting to a quite extreme religiosity within a matter of months. What we'd all love to go back in time and see exactly what happened. Of course, we know the breakdown of the marriage, and that certainly had something to do with it. He had various friends who converted to Catholicism. Um, but in, in, in short answer to your question, I think that in Vile Bodies, he is, he is looking at a, uh, a godless society. Um, and, and maybe it's by looking at that godless society and by really going through it and writing about it, it may have had some impetus for him to think, well, something's got to change. Um, but I, I don't think you can look really at any part of our body and say, this is an intentionally religious book. And I, and I don't really, unless you quickly found something there, think that there's anything in there that points to the conversion that was about to take place. It seems more like commentary on the decline of religion. Yeah, uh, well, I think that's I think that's right. Mm -hmm. And he went through phase. You know, he wanted to be a priest when he was a boy. He, he was set up little when, when everybody else was asking for presents like toy guns and things from their aunts. He said, "Can I can I have a sort of toy altar um, <laughs> and, a, and a toy priest costume?" <laughs> um, so he went in and out of it, and then, of course, as we know, converted in 1930, and then became increasingly religious, but. His books weren't that religious, really, until um, until uh, Bright Vision of Liberty. And that, of course, was affected very much by the uh, Second World War, which he was fighting in and the experiences he had. And that then suddenly it becomes <coughs> almost a mania for him, rather like it did for Tolstoy. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
alcohol seems to be, at least to me, a motif in this one. Yeah. Did you say <laughs> it's, because it's like it's all over the place, did you say it's mainly, uh, just meant to portray the Roaring Twenties period, or that, would you say it's, uh, it has like a greater theme or a point to it, for example, like escaping reality? Um, even more loved alcohol, as you can probably <laughs> tell. He had much too much of it. He got very, very drunk when he was at uh, university. I think one of the one of my favourite scenes in Vile Bodies has to be when Adam wakes up in the Shepherd's Hotel and the waiter comes bringing some kippers and he's got an appalling hangover and he smells the kippers and then he starts thinking about the difference between the smell of food and the taste of food and and he says how uh, you know how God how marvelous it must have been for God who lived off the savour of things. Uh, you know, the smell of fresh buns and how they taste much nicer than the actual dull taste of buns. I don't know if you remember this, it's just looking for half a page. And then he wanders off, almost falls back, says, Oh, for the wings of the dove, said Ab Adam, wandering a little off the point, something like that. It's the most beautiful description of a hangover. Um, <laughs> Evelyn um, uh, was a great drinker and he, he wrestled with drink in a very mad way. Uh, there's a very fascinating story of. Um, of a man who, when they were very young, I think uh, about 1926, so he was in his late 20s, he'd arranged to meet Evelyn in a pub in London. And he arrived at the pub uh, about 10 minutes late, and Evelyn was completely unconscious. And, uh, and he said to the barman, well, what's happened? I've come to see my friend, why, why are you knocked out? And the barman said, I've never seen anything like it in my life. It was extraordinary. He came in about 15 minutes ago. He ordered a drink. He drank it absolutely immediately. Then another, then another. And it was like he had the devil in him. And he was, he was wanting to challenge the drink. It was a sort of, you know, who's going to win? Me or the drink? Um, then, of course, by the end of his life, he got rather depressed. Because he drank much too much. And as some of you may know, he started mixing uh, disgusting things like creme de menthe with... Um, a sleeping pill he took called the chloral or something and it sent him very mad and he he wrote a book about going mad um a very good book called the ordeal of gilbert Pinfold, um, which was uh, partly alcohol induced um but uh i mean he drank a bit at home I mean, he was never restricted from drinking um but it was leaving home that gave him this huge sense of liberation and and getting drunk and and enjoying getting drunk um, there's a wonderful scene in Brideshead Revisited when a man, uh, a cousin, comes to see uh, Charles Ryder at university and he says, I've been told by your father to come and see you and tell you to stop drinking. He says, I enjoy drinking. I really, really like it. I don't regret it at all. Would you like to glass of champagne like that at five o'clock in the morning? <laughs> um, so I think on that, again, you know, it's ambivalent whether he's, he's certainly, and one thing I can tell you 100% that he's not mocking or, or disapproving of drink in vile bodies. Um, he's not uh, a temperance moralist, uh, but he sees it as part of the mix and part of the colour. And I suppose he oh, saw so many drunk people and thought they were funny and wanted to put them in. Uh, yeah. Um, I was just curious, would the book have a different ending if he had not gotten into the book? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think probably yes. He did say that when he wrote a book, he, he got some characters and he put them on the paper and then he pushed them around a bit and saw where they went. I don't think very often that he had planned the end by when he started. And quite often, because he was often broke, um, he, even though he was quite successful at these things, he would sell parts of the book before he published it as short stories. Um, he wrote a very interesting thing about a character in a book called put out more flags. He gave an interview and uh, he said, I, I was writing this book and I, I couldn't understand her. A very odd thing for a novelist to say, I can't <laughs> understand the character that you've invented. <laughs> he said, I just couldn't understand her. It didn't make sense. And I, I got about halfway through the book, three quarters way through the book, and I suddenly realized I've got it. She's an alcoholic. It's that simple. Not, not, it's an interesting way to put it because he didn't say, I can fix the problem by making her an alcoholic. If I make her into an alcoholic, that'll give her some character that'll make the book better. He didn't. It's not how he put it, and it's not what he meant. He said, I suddenly understand why she's like she is, she's an alcoholic. Then he went back in the book and just put a few empty bottles by her bedside and stuff like that, just, just, just to point it up. But it was a strange thing that he always had with these books, that it was the characters who told him about them, not he was inventing them out of plasticine and making them from the start. 
and they often went off in directions he had no idea they were going to end up. Um, so, in short answer to your question, I'd say yes. I would say it definitely would have been different if events had happened differently. But unfortunately, I can't tell you precisely how. <laughs> but I'm sure that he was very sensitive to what was going on in his life, and things just moved around as, as he was doing them. Yeah. Um, you read the Great Gatsby and the Great Gatsby? He read it strangely late, the Great Gatsby. And, and I think he was a, a fan of it. There, there is a sort of similarity, isn't there? Um, can anybody here who's clever and better than I tell me the date of Great Gatsby? Oh, it's 1925. 25, so it was, yes. It was, I, I'm pretty sure he read it after. I'm pretty sure. And I think he came to me and said that he realised it was a funny similarity. Yes. <laughs> um, I think, I think, but I may be wrong, and I'm sorry I can't give you a straight answer on this. I think he read it really late, like in the 1950s. Like that. Mm -hmm. But he certainly read in that book. But which book did you die? When did Scott Fitzgerald write? Um, 40s. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they, they never met. No. I, he, they wouldn't have met. Evelyn Moore didn't really become a celebrity in, in America until 